All right. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Untherapeutic Relationship Podcast for people who don't go to therapy. Today, I am I'm super excited because we are going to dive into a topic um, that impacts so many women um, that I, I can't even begin to state some of the statistics uh, because, again, it's, it's so prevalent and I see it on a day to day in counseling. So I'm I am super excited because I. Um, Jonetta Rose Barris, and I was I was mispronouncing it before we jumped <laughs> on it, is a pioneer in this space. Uh, she is a true pioneer in this space. And so she is the author of a book, uh, Whatever Happened to Daddy's Little Girl, The Impact of Fatherlessness on Black Women. She's also the founder of Esther Productions, Inc. And I'm going to let her share a little bit more about her story and about herself. And then we're going to just dive in. What what is the impact of our father or daddy issues sometimes, as we say, um, on on relationships and women in particular? So to, to tell, tell us a little bit about yourself, Janetta. Well, Dr. Nick, first, thank you very much for having me on your show. I am so honored and uh, appreciate so much the opportunity to talk about this very important topic, which you are also an expert on. Uh, so I appreciate you having me. Um, I actually uh, fell into this issue um, as a journalist in the 1990s when there was, I think, a male fatherless movement. There were men, mainly white men at the time, who were really concerned about uh, the absence of fathers in the home and what that meant for boys. Mm. And I was reporting on that. I was reporting on that actually for the Washington Times. Um, a guy named Wade Horn uh, mm. was one of the founders uh, of that movement. He eventually went into the federal government. And um, But while he was uh, working with the National Fatherhood Movement, um, I uh, did some research and came away with the with the uh, question that I considered the quintessential question. Mm -hmm. If fathers are so important to sons, why aren't they important to daughters? Shouldn't they be important to daughters? Shouldn't we care about what happens no. to fathers and daughters? Mm -hmm. And that led me to start doing some research in, uh, ironically or incredibly, at the same time that I had begun to look at what was happening to fathers and daughters, uh, my mother called me up and asked me, would you like to meet your father? Hmm. And I said, oh, you know, he doesn't really care about me. And, and she said, no, I mean your real father. And it was at that point that I learned that the man that my mother was married to and had been married to, although somewhat separated from, for nearly two decades, was really not my father. Wow. And um, and um, I had, of course, uh, been traumatized uh, by the fact that this man, who was the father of my siblings, my brother and my sister, my older brother and sister, never really took to me. And I felt... Um, his absence, our lack of love or lack of attention as I was growing up. And so I was affected by his absence, even though he wasn't my father, I thought he was. Yeah. And so that was the beginning of my journey into meeting my father, uh, who had uh, been involved in my life when I was an infant uh, and had actually said to my mother, he wanted to take me and have his mother raise me. And that was when my mother said, well, you will never get to see her again. Wow. And he was looking for me for 30 years, trying to find me after that. Mm -hmm. And she never told him where I was. At one point, I was an adult and uh, living in Washington, D.C., and he was living in Baltimore, Maryland. Wow. And um, if people in your audience do not realize that's only 50 miles apart. And um, we could have had a great time. He was much younger. And I, of course, was young. And But she never told him. And the only reason I actually got to meet my father was that 
my father went to my grandfather, my mother's father, and said, you, you will tell him where his daughter is and you will help them make the contact, which she did. Mm -hmm. And I got to see my father and uh, spend some time with him. And he subsequently died uh, two or three years after we met each other uh, or reacquainted ourselves. It was not what I call a um, reconciliation. It was um, a meeting and um an ineffective fail. Uh, we actually didn't bond because I had unrealistic um, ideas of what it would mean to meet my father. Wow. Um, wow. So you know, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I, I tell you, I, and, I, and I'm like holding back because everything in me wants to like almost make it into like a counseling session, right? Like, <laughs> well, how was that experience for you? Talk to me a little bit about that. And, and, and But I do want to come back to that because especially around just the expectations around a father who may not be involved. And so I'm just, just make sure I don't forget before the end to, to bring that back up okay, and I will. Love to hear what those expectations were and, and how you navigated that after the fact, especially once he had passed. But let me just start at a super high level. Um, you know, as I was sharing with you before we, we hit record, you know, a lot of women, particularly in counseling, come and maybe experiencing, you know, what people call, and I put air quotes around this, daddy issues, you know. Um, some of it may be valid, some of it may not be. But in your experience, how do you believe women are most impacted as a result of, say, their dad being absent or inconsistent in his presence? Or present and and not engaged yeah. uh, is one of the other things I talk about in my book. In my book, I talk about five fatherless factors, fatherless daughter factors. I call it the fatherless daughter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And um, e e every woman who has had, uh, who has been affected or had this challenge of father absence has dealt with one or two of these challenges throughout their lives, these kinds of symptoms throughout their lives. The one that is probably most prevalent and I think affects relationships, um, personal relationships and even professional relationships in some instances. And that is the sense of feeling that you're unloved and unlovable, mm -hmm. which consequently presses you into various circumstances um, that are not healthy and in some instances cause you to react in ways that are not appropriate uh, because you're making assumptions about the relationship in which you're involved and making assumptions about the people in those relationships, whether personal or professional. Um, and the other, the other factor that I think is most prevalent, well, there, there are three that I think are most prevalent. Uh, the second one is this triple fear factor, I call the fear of rejection, fear of commitment, and um, and fear of abandonment. Wow. And so, and so, what happens is uh, you you kind of anticipate that things are not going to go well in any situation, and the least sign that things are beginning to shift from what they were to something else in your mind, anyway, uh, you're ready to run. And I, I used to tell people that I, no one ever broke up with me. I broke up with <laughs> every man, every man I ever was with, I broke up with them. Yeah, and, yeah. and it was always, it's like, you know, I always played the defense game, you know, like, no, no, oh no, the offense game rather. No, 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 you're not going to get me. I'm going to get you first. Yeah, yeah, and no, I know you're going to get me. I'm saying it's over, not you. you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so it was that kind of situation. And as a result, I probably lost out on, you know, at least a couple of really good relationships. And also with respect to even platonic uh, relationships, because you're giving yourself to a friend. Uh, you're giving your heart, your soul, your spirit. And if a friend, uh, for whatever reasons, maybe 
the friend is having a bad day and says something mm -hmm. and it, it touches you in the wrong place and you're subject to leave. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in high school and even in college and maybe even as I became uh, an adult, I can remember that I didn't really join clubs. Uh, I didn't want there to be a moment where someone would have an opportunity to say, we don't want you here anymore. Wow. And uh, and so as a result, I, I didn't join and I stayed on the periphery and I'll bounce in, I'll bounce out. But I never wanted anyone to feel like they had control over my happiness or joy. And certainly if they rejected me, then they certainly had that. Yeah. Um, and then the other one was uh, is rather uh, what I call the R.A.D. factor rage, anger, and depression. Um, and uh, of course, you know, Black women uh, have this terrible reputation. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's earned, often, most often it's not earned, yeah. that we are some angry people. Uh, well, to a certain extent, we have a right to be angry if you consider uh, the history of Blacks in America. But mm -hmm. going beyond that, uh, you know, uh, we, we, you know, I remember uh, a friend of mine, Joe Black, who was uh, president at one time of of, um, of uh, the bus company, uh, Greyhound Bus Company. And he said uh, he met me in in uh, Jackson, Mississippi. And he said, why are you so angry? And mm -hmm. I said, I'm not angry. I, 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 I was a community organizer. I said, I have the I, I have righteous indignation. And, mm -hmm. and so I dismissed him. And then uh, my five-year-old daughter one day asked me, Ma, why are you arguing with everyone? And I said, I am not arguing with everyone. But when your five-year-old daughter raises that question, yeah. it, it gives you pause. And you it want does. to say, perhaps I should reflect on this and mm -hmm. and sure enough there was inexplicable anger and and it's you know as a child and you don't you, you know you think about you don't know how to express that you're you're really angry with with the adults who have caused you to lose somebody that you love or you're angry with this adult who you love who just skipped and left and didn't say anything didn't say goodbye didn't say anything or you find out that there's this person who is supposed to be in your life as your father and never bothered to even drop around to bring you a doll or yeah. you know a card for your birthday or take you for an ice cream cone or any of that and so that kind of stuff uh, stays inside your heart mm -hmm. unless you make a real effort to heal yeah. and 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 a lot of us who need therapy dr nick don't ask for it we don't mm -hmm. we don't bother we think we can heal ourselves and to a certain extent we can but we have to know first that there is pain there that we have to acknowledge it and it took me a while to really acknowledge it. And that book that I wrote uh, was that acknowledgement. Interestingly, there were people who, when they read the book, they they couldn't believe it because here I am, an accomplished journalist in the city. Mm -hmm. I, you know, in Washington D.C., I give people uh, the time of day, and it's mm -hmm. not always polite. And and so they think, well, you're a tough cookie. You know, yes, you're just yeah, yeah. You almost adopt, adapt, Excuse me to what you were you were you were forced to almost endure to yes yeah. exactly exactly let me so, ask you this real quick you know going back to you talked about um you know you have these issues where you're affected okay and let's just use the example of when you said you know i'm, I'm gonna get you before you get me all right <laughs> now some relationships you actually do need to leave and so how did you or how would you encourage someone to separate the two? Like, is this me responding to, say, daddy issues or, you know, my fear of, you know, being rejected? Or is this a toxic relationship that I actually need to leave? You know, I, how, do you, how do you decipher between the two? I don't think you can make a distinction unless you are in touch with yourself in touch with your own true emotions. And many times we are making decisions about relationships without really understanding why we're making those decisions. Um, most often we don't, we don't have, we don't engage in deliberate action. 
It's all instinct. And most times when you're dealing with your instinct, you're really coming from an emotional space. You're not necessarily coming from a combination of emotion and intellect and reasoning. Okay. And so in my case, when I was leaving these guys, I was looking at their behavior. And, and, and in some instances, it wasn't necessarily toxic, but it was that I had begun to depend on them. I was clinging to them for an understanding of who I was mm -hmm. and, and looking for them to determine my worth and my value. And when they, when they changed their approach to me, it said to me that I was no longer worthy. And so before they hurt me, before they caused me to feel even more worthless than I was feeling, I left. Mm. Now, there were, in hindsight, obviously, there were some cases where guys mm. were just yeah. dogs. Yeah, right. I went yeah, to those dogs because yeah. I was looking for love in all the wrong places. Mm -hmm. And that's why it becomes so important for you to understand who it is, who you are, rather. Yeah. What your, what, what has the, what has life circumstances brought to you and how you've managed those and how they are causing you to interact or not with people. Mm -hmm. And what does it mean when someone is not interacting with you at a level where you have arrived and, and determined you are worth that? It took yeah. me a long time. I was in my late thirties when I met my when I met my father, I wrote my book and right after that, after he died. Mm -hmm. And, but it took me a while. It took me writing that book to really appreciate all the mistakes I had made about assessing my own worth and value. Mm -hmm. And therefore the message I was sending to other people was that they should treat me poorly too, because I didn't believe I was worth anything. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you this. You know, you talk about, you know, obviously meeting your, your father late in your 30s and writing this book. And also you mentioned earlier about, you know, being in touch with your own emotions. Why do you think it is so difficult in many instances to, I, I guess, do the work or to kind of get to the place where you say, you know what, I, I actually am dealing with this. Why is that oftentimes difficult? for people to kind of revisit this part of their life that they may be affected about. Affected oh my God, it is such an emotional experience. When I was writing the book and I went all the way back to I was five years old and, um, and uh, remembering a relationship that my mother had uh, with this man who was not uh, who was not my father and was not her husband. At this mm -hmm. point, she was living with him and, but I fell madly in love with him. Mm. And for me, he was like my father. And uh, I saw him that way. And uh, one day he was there and the next day he was gone. He had been there for, I don't know how long. And then he was just gone. And um, I, I cried and cried and it was only when I wrote the book and my mother, uh, as adults do, um, they don't weigh children's emotions. They mm -hmm. ignore often, or they think they'll grow through it. Mm -hmm. And if something impacts a child pretty strongly in childhood, they are not going to go through it without particular guided assistance, mm -hmm. um, counseling, uh, mm -hmm. therapies, talking, something. Yeah. And so in my case, when I was writing my book, I asked my mother to look for a particular picture. And I said, uh, Noel was the guy's name. I said, can you find this picture? And she says, well, describe the picture. So I described the picture. I was on a car. I had Shirley Temple curls. Mm -hmm. Noel was sitting next to yeah, me. Standing next to me. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, the whole thing. I described <laughs> yeah, I it like back here. <laughs> <laughs> and my mother found the picture. And it was at that moment that she realized how traumatized I had been when he left because who holds that image 
in their mind all those years unless there's something that happened. You yeah. felt something. And so I think what happens then is it, it, in order to try to heal, uh, in my case, I, I, I sought to try to heal myself. Uh, and in order to do that, that means going back over all that territory, yeah. all that territory. And when I found my father, when I finally went to see my father um, in New Orleans, he was a half mile from where I had actually grown up mm -hmm. as a girl on the very same street, wow. same Ferdinand Street. He had, yeah. he had found an apartment. He had come back to New Orleans and found an apartment on St. Ferdinand Street, which was the very street we lived on. His apartment was maybe five blocks from the junior high school I attended. Mm -hmm. And so I say in my book, that our lives in most instances are travel the same territory. We are circling ourselves until we heal ourselves. Yeah. Do you think that it's, you know, just, just hearing that I had two questions that are completely unrelated, but <laughs> one is, I just want to say before I forget, you know, one is thinking about your mom, how I want to, I'd be interested to, to, to hear how you navigated potentially being resentful towards her as a re as it relates to her role in the relationship with your your father. Um, but then, you know, also, too, do you think it's possible for someone whose father isn't involved, like say, you know, say same experience and they not have dad issues? Or do you think that whether you realize it or not, if the father is absent, is it fair to say that you probably are dealing with some variant of, of, of daddy issues as a result of that? I think so. I think the latter is true, that there you are dealing with it in small and sometimes big ways. OK, but it's never I mean, you stomp your toe and it may not you may not have broken your toe, mm -hmm. but you definitely bruised it yeah. or it hurts a little bit for a little mm -hmm. while. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if we just use that little analogy, which may not be a very good analogy, yeah, no, but, it, it, is, so. but yeah. it, it is it is sort of what happens in in my case with my uh, with my sisters. Uh, my older sister used to say, well, I, I, I never I never I never had any problems. Well, my oldest sister went looking for love in all the wrong places, got pregnant at 14, 15 mm -hmm. years old, um, and basically had a pretty rough life. And um, But she would not attribute that to her father not being with her. But in reality, that was a part of the factor, really. Mm -hmm. uh, my own brother, who uh, ended up um, getting in trouble at a very young age, he certainly wouldn't probably wouldn't contribute it to that, but it attributed to that, but, but it was. Right. And so there are, you know, big things that happen to us that uh, we can look at our childhood and we can pinpoint aspects of our childhood. That's why the whole adverse childhood experiences, I'm so happy that they did that study, even though the study was done with mainly white people, yep. but it, it, it nevertheless, it affects, it's a human uh, kind of dynamic yeah. that none of us really appreciated until that study was done. And, and they you put it in such a succinct way. So you could say, you know, I have four on the A scale. I have a five, yeah. you know? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> And and when you do that, and and one of the one of the biggest ones that they talk about, or or the ones that have one of the ones that have the longest impact is parental abandonment. Mm -hmm. And so you know, and and that is what you call father absence. It's a it's a form of parental abandonment. Yeah. And uh, and when you think about fathers and the impact they have on their daughters, um, which a lot of people will never, you know, admit, but, but they are real things. Even something as simple as a girl's femininity being mm -hmm. as shaped in many ways by, by the presence of her father and, or the absence of her father. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I do think that that's, that is, uh, there are, 
I don't I don't think you can get escape completely. I'll say that way. Absolutely. As Absolutely. for my mother, uh, when I came back from meeting my father that first time, uh, that first summer, which I called the summer of my discontent, mm-hmm. um, and I came back and I was enraged. Mm. Why would you lie? Yeah. You, you have a, a man's name on my birth certificate who isn't really my father. Yeah. You know, why, why would you lie to me for all these years? And even after I became an adult. And so I was like, and so then she started talking about the relationship she had with him and um, that he he could be abusive. And I said, well, I appreciate that. I, I'm sorry you had that experience, but maybe I wouldn't have had that experience. You needed to allow me as an adult, especially as an adult, to decide what kind of relationship I wanted with him. I may have come to the same place that you came, that I didn't want to have anything to do with him because he was abusive. He was this, he was that, he was, but those were, those were all things that he had to have been with me and not necessarily with you. Mm -hmm. And, and so funny enough, by the time he was dying, she was the one who was at the hospital with him. And I was the one who refused to go and see him. Wow. Wow. It's crazy how that turns. Yeah. Now, that you're, now that you're, and you're still young, but now that you're a little <laughs> bit older, do you, has your perspective shifted on her kind of keeping him out of your life? I mean, obviously, you know, as a child, it's a little bit different, but like as an adult woman, not giving you that information that, the man that you think is your father is actually not. Has has your perspective shifted at all? It's made me, my experience has made me more, um, more determined to send the message to women, to mothers, that they should allow their daughters to have relationships with their fathers. Mm-hmm. Unless the father is a drunk, a drug addict, a violent uh, abuser and is prone to abuse his children, there's no reason he should not be able to engage in or attempt to yeah. build a relationship with his children. I find that to be very uh, important. And I, I often say to women, you have to be able to separate your relationship fr- with your your former mate, your lover, whatever the relationship was, from the relationship that he has with his children. Mm -hmm. And you can't be blocking, uh, which we know mothers do all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's not healthy for them because then they can't extricate themselves from a relationship that's not healthy for them because they're still trying to make it into something that it'll never be, obviously. Mm -hmm. And they're feeding their children such negative uh, stories and information that it then um, it then creates an, a, a situation where the children can never also escape, um, yeah. either by having a good relationship or by deciding that they don't want to have any relationship, which there are in yeah. case in some cases children do decide that they don't want to have a relationship with their fathers as they get older. Sometimes they've decided, you know what? It's not worth it. Yeah. Now what about the inconsistent father? Because I remember, and I, not, I remember, I I see, I mean, I work only work, work with adults now, but when I did work with kids, I would see moms sometimes put these guardrails in place, not because they didn't want their, daughter or son to have a relationship with the father they just didn't want the inconsistencies i'm coming i don't show up i'm gonna do this and then i don't do it and and they're left to deal with the the impact of these broken promises you know and so as a response it was i'm gonna establish a uh, uh, something that we can depend on which is you're not there. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Well, that's a hard one to tell you the truth. And I, I, I just, um, my organization, Esther Productions, does a essay contests every year. Yeah. And it's for fatherless girls to write mm-hmm. about their dealings with the challenge of father absence. 
And that is one of the issues that comes up invariably in, in many of the essays where you're waiting on a Saturday for him to come or you're waiting for your birthday for him to come and he doesn't come. And actually, in most instances, the children decide themselves that they cannot they cannot engage in this relationship because it causes them too much sadness. Yeah. And and so and and I'm I'm always appreciative when a child has that kind of maturity. Uh, yeah. And I do think that in some instances, a mother or a grandparent or whomever it is has to step in and say, hey, uh, this is causing too much harm. Mm -hmm. Now, we've got to figure out how to make this happen better. That's why in some instances we've been advocating co-parenting. So there's some kind of, uh, of uh, consistency in the interaction and the consistency in the interaction doesn't necessarily involve the courts and or involve the mother to the extent that the mother has to say, this is when you can pick her up, that this is all predetermined. There's a contract, there's all of that. So yeah. that's a that's a way to deal with it. But I, I think that you do as a mother or as a, a custodial parent, you do have the responsibility to try to prevent any emotional harm to your child. Because yeah. that mama bear instinct will, will yeah. you, you know, you got one or two times, and, you know, yeah. you could take the most quiet woman, she, you know, dealing with the kids, you bring something else out. You know, exactly. So. It does. Let me switch gears a little bit. You know, when dating someone. So this comes up a lot. Someone dating something and say they know that, you know, say a young lady or, you know, father wasn't wasn't there. And they almost hang that over their head in certain instances. You know, like, oh, you're responding like this because your daddy wasn't there. Or you're doing this because you don't know how to treat. And, it, and it's tricky because we do know that there are implications of a father not being there, but how can you determine if someone is using that as a manipulative tool to gaslight certain behavior? Yeah. Or if they're being honest, like, hey, man, there are some unresolved issues here that you need to address because it's affecting how you're showing up in the in the relationship or the marriage. How do you decipher between the two? Well, that's why I think it's very important for we women to really have a conversation with ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, you didn't grow up without your father. You should have some idea of what it meant to you. Uh, if you're in the dating space, you should have some idea of how that affected you. It's also true, Dr. Nick, when you grow up with a father who's near perfect mm -hmm. and and a guy has to live under that. And yeah. and so so it's just it's like the, to my the daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and so you can't live, you can't do anything right because he has done everything you right. You know? Party, you know? <laughs> exactly. I'm You'll joking. see that. You'll see that when your girls grow up, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. You in the house, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so I think that what happens, I remember when my essay, uh, which I wrote an essay first and then I wrote the book. And mm -hmm. when the essay ran in the Washington City paper, the first reaction I got was from a man mm -hmm. who had been married for five years. And okay. he says, oh, my God, I'm so glad you wrote this, he says, because my wife won't let me do a damn thing. Yeah. I can't take out the trash. I can't do this. I can't do that. You know, and and I could relate to that because at one point um, I I they had found a lump in my breast and I, I needed to get it removed. And and so. And the guy I was dating at the time uh, said, well, I can take you to the hospital. You know, it was an in and out procedure. And he mm -hmm. said, I can take you to the hospital and, you know, and I can come back and get you. And I said, well, okay. I said, I, I don't think I need you to take me to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And he says, oh, well, why, why don't I come in and pick you up? He says, because you're going to be bandaged up and you're going to yeah, be on yeah. medication. And, and I said, no, I don't think I, I don't think I need that. He said, but then they might give you a prescription. And, and so you, you know, then I could go to the store and get it. And I refused to let this guy do anything. And you know why? It's because I was worried that under these circumstances that were really traumatic for me, that he might not show up 
or he might be five minutes late or 10 minutes late. Yeah. And so that is, that goes all the way back to having someone not there for you who should have been there for you when you were growing up. And, you know, it, it, you don't realize that until you, you say, Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This yeah. is, this is definitely related to that. And yeah. you can like pretend that it's not, but it is. And yeah. so, so, but if you haven't had that conversation with yourself, if you haven't sat down and, and put a list together and say, this is how my father absence affected me and is affecting me. This is how it's not affecting me. These are the advantages for not having my father around. I became a strong, independent woman. I mean, yeah. I, I'm very resilient. I'm this, I'm that. In a relationship, I can, I can be clingy uh, to a certain extent. And, um, or I want the person to be, you know, all things at all times in every circumstance. And, and so there are, there are behaviors that um, we need to appreciate are related to that. Yeah. You know, another thing too, just, just as you're talking, let me say this, even if you know that doing that can still be difficult. And I see that a lot, you know, we're like, aware of it like you know what i probably should let this dude come take me to the hospital yeah right? exactly <laughs> but, but, but but everything in you is like no nah, i'm driving there you know yeah. and so sometimes you can connect on an intellectual level like you're right i probably should allow you to do this yeah, or, yeah you know i am responding like this as a result but but actually changing the behavior can be quite difficult it is what is that first step like if someone makes a a a conscious decision that they want to kind of work through, navigate this space. Like what is that first step that they can take to actually do what they already know? I think the first step for me was being honest to say, Hey, this had a real profound impact on me as a person. And I, I need to understand that and go back and look at what I say is like packing your bags. I remember when I was in an exercise class once, a jazzercise class, the woman brought this 20 pound paper bag to class, the teacher. Mm -hmm. and, so, and she had a bunch of cans and she had us put all the cans in it. And, and so she's like, okay, so you're 20 pounds overweight, pick this up. And this is what you're carrying around with you everywhere mm -hmm. you go. There is a similar exercise that I always say to people uh, that you should um, perform. Think about what has been, what are the things, the emotional things that bothered you about not having your father? You weren't, you couldn't go to the father daughter dance. Uh, you know, you're writing uh, Father's Day cards to your grandfather, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're in a relationship with a guy and you don't have anybody to talk to. Um, and, you know, and okay, you could talk to your platonic male friends, but that's not the same as not talking today. to your father, you know, mm -hmm. and um, it's your birthday and you want somebody to just, you know, so there are all these little small things that have registered in your mind and and they just sit there and sit there every year and they fester and so what you have to do is start taking them out and putting them in front of you and saying you know what this is not important anymore throw yeah. that away this is not important anymore throw that away and so at some point you come to a place where only what's important to your uh, health, emotional health, your physical health, your well-being is what you have in your bag now. Mm -hmm. And you're willing to carry that around. The other thing I think is in a situation like that, where, where some guy is trying to tell you, hey, you got all these daddy issues and you can turn around and say, yeah, what are your daddy issues? Yeah, that is real. <laughs> you know, because I always tell people, mm -hmm. if you're getting ready to get in a serious relationship, or if you're thinking about marrying someone, he wants to marry you, time to sit down and have a talk. Because chances are in 21st century America, both of you have had issues with your dads. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. OK, and you need to be able to discuss that because a lot of times marriages and or uh, romantic relationships don't don't last because of re- daddy issues or mommy issues. Sometimes uh, guys have mommy issues. Mm-hmm. And um, that's another episode. <laughs> yeah, that's another episode we'll talk about. Right? <laughs> but but those those issues are uh, also affect uh, relationships. And so. And sometimes in in a situation like what you were talking about, where a guy says you're having daddy issues, it's also him basically saying you're not trusting me. You don't you don't think I respect you. You don't think I love you. I'm not that person. I'm not that person who hurt you when you were a child. But the triple triff, uh, triple fear factor is very difficult because. It is based on trust. And once that trust is broken, it's very hard for you to kind of rebuild it. You have to really work on on coming to a place where you trust not the other person, but yourself. Yeah, that's so good. Oh, gosh, that is. I want to I want to go back to this perfect dad uh, situation. And, (laughs) you you know, because my daughters are going to struggle with this. So I want to go ahead and get it on record. (laughs) I'm joking. I'm joking. But I will say this, there are so there is so much that they don't see. And it's e- it could be easy for them to see only one side of the equation and use that as a standard when in reality they don't see the angry that what well, they do, but you know, yeah. they don't see all the stuff happening behind the scenes. And so when you you working with someone who has this dad, not, not say perfect, right? But and this is a real life story. I was working with someone not too long ago, and 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 the guy was coming home, and you know just kind of relaxing a little bit, and it, and, and it was like problematic for this this lady. She was mm-hmm. like, Man, "My dad never chilled," you know. So to see you yeah. just relaxing is like, you know, one of the deadly sins, you know. Yes. <laughs> he worked in jobs, and he he yeah. did things, he did that, and he did. You know, and he's like, man, I'm, I'm not your dad, you know, and he wasn't a bad guy. But when compared to this Superman. Yes. Or at least the image that she had. In had mind, him. He was always coming up short yeah. in those situations. How do you navigate that as well? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, you know, the only Superman in my in my life was my grandfather. Mm, who, okay, um, yeah. Who was like, I don't I don't think anybody could ever live up to to his image in my mind. Mm-hmm. And so I, I try not to burden anyone with that because yeah. I realize it is my image of him. Uh, but I don't think that I think that obviously each person in that situation has to have a conversation and has to understand uh, what they're dealing with, but it all does come down to trust. Mm-hmm. So I'm not, I might be chilling in the next five minutes, but after that, I'm going to do everything you want me to do because, you know, I love you. I care about you. I want you to be happy. And, and at some point though, you get tired. The guy gets tired repeating yeah. that mantra. And, um, and so it, it really does become a situation where, you know, you're, as a woman, you're sabotaging your relationship. Um, I remember when I was on a book tour and this woman who was gorgeous, I mean, she looked like a model. She Mm -hmm. was, you know, she just was put together and everything. And she stooped down when I was signing her book and she says, I think I'm destroying my marriage. Wow. And I said, why do you think that? And she says, because I cannot trust my husband. And it's not that he hasn't done anything. I mean, he hasn't stepped out on me or anything like that. I'm just having a hard time. And so we talked about, well, what 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 would you like to do? How do you have you had this conversation with him? Mm -hmm. Have you talked to him about why it is that you're having difficulty? It's not him that's having the difficulty, it's you. And you realize that it's affecting the relationship, then you ought to open that conversation. You ought not wait for him to open that conversation. Uh, But the perfect daddy, I think, is also a daddy who has to see his daughters having a difficult time in a relationship and do what daddies are supposed to do, which Mm -hmm. is talk to his daughter about it. And 
maybe even talk to them as a couple. And I think that in, you know, many years ago, probably not in uh, in our generation, but in generations earlier, that's what would have happened. A father would have said, listen, which is what my father said to my mother, hold mm-hmm. it. This man been looking for his daughter for 30 years and you've been like, yeah. you know, blocking him and everything and you know where she is. And no, we're not going to do that anymore. Here's why we're not going to do that anymore. He has a right. You know, you see me all the time. Yeah. And imagine what it would be like if you didn't get to see me anytime you want it. Yeah, that's so good. And you're right. I think that 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 last part just around the conversation and obviously at the right age, but I, I just, you know, as you're talking, I'm, I'm just imagining in my head how beneficial it would be to have that, that, that just honest dialogue, you know, like yes. you see me or your dad in this way. And not to say that any of that is not true. It's just so much other stuff that you didn't see that actually yes. went bad. It went into creating that. And, and so sometimes that can obviously, you know, work in their favor. Yes. Listen, thank you so much, Miss um, Janetta. I am. I'm, I'll, oh, not Miss Janetta. Please, just Janetta. Janetta. Okay. You know, I, you, all right, my bad. That's that, that's that down south coming out. Thanksgiving, too. You know, yes. I'm, I'm, you know, yeah. But you know, I, I really do appreciate it. This is a topic I know that is so important. Fatherhood is 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 central to just who I am, obviously, from a practitioner, researcher, just all of that. And so to have you share this space, I'm super excited. Where can people find you and where can people purchase this book? Obviously, we're going to put the link in the in the notes, but, you know, where, where well, can people can, They can with? find the book at, you know, Amazon or um, the book was, uh, it's a Random House book. Um, okay. So it's still available in paperback. Um, it's been a while since it came out, but um, everything in the book, I think it's still relevant. And so do a lot of other people. Um, my yeah. organization is Esther Productions, Inc.com. It's E S T A G R productions, Inc.com. You can reach me there. People, you know, people sometimes call me, uh, one woman who worked with my organization for five years was working on her master's degree. And she told her advisor, well, I'm going to just call her. And mm-hmm. she called me and I called her right back. And yeah. she was surprised. <laughs> and so I do, I do talk to people because I know it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a major issue. Uh, and if you're struggling with it and you want to improve your life, I want to be able to offer whatever assistance I can. And so people can write to me also at Esther Productions Inc. at gmail.com. That's Esther mm-hmm. Productions Inc. at gmail.com. And I always answer my emails. She does. She does. Well, thank <laughs> you so much. Thank, thank you, so much. you for having me. Absolutely. And so everybody tune in. Uh, obviously, more episodes come in. You can follow us online at um, Nick Hardy underscore. You can also subscribe on our YouTube channel and watch the entire episode. Thanks so much. See you later.